Hello everyone, uh, this is Islam Boynazarov and I will make a brief lecture on the topic of technologies of teaching pronunciation, uh, specifically for 10th and 11th uh, grades and academic lyceums in the context of Uzbekistan. And this lecture, this topic is offered um, in the course of methodology of teaching languages and educational technologies and the number of the lecture is 10. So in this lecture, we will talk about the pronunci teaching pronunciation and its uh, place in the uh, language curriculum and also testing and evaluation how instructors or EFL, ESL teachers at public schools uh, have to test and evaluate their students' knowledge before, while, and after the course. And also we'll move uh, on talking about the uh, very useful techniques, tools, and uh, technologies. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about some recommendations given by scholars, so that uh, those the recommendations are the latest one, uh, on how to teach B1 uh, level students to pronunciation. Okay, let's start. So at the initial phase of our lecture, I have to mention that English is a lingua franca. So that is to say that there is no more a standard English uh, that everyone has to follow or that everyone has to, um, you know, the, the mimic. Uh, so there are a lot of variations of English in the world these days like Indian English, Australian English, and uh, the British English, American English. And besides that, we have Spanish English, Chinese English, and there's so many variations. And uh, in today's global world, it's very important for uh, upcoming generation, the, the learners at schools to uh you know to to un to be able to understand all those variations and also at the same time uh to be able to communicate with them so uh the there is a wonderful uh, scholar Jennifer Jenkins um uh, she did a lot of work on this topic and uh i quote uh it's more important to be able to adjust your english than to be able to mimic uh so this is what she said it's uh, it's right on the point, um, which basically means that we have to help our students to set a realistic goals and to try try to adjust their English to uh, you know the to all the variations uh, of Englishes in the, in the world, uh, and uh, this is going to make their um, life way way easier. Okay, uh, so. When we start talking about the pronunciation in the language curriculum, we have to mention some um, some things like uh, setting realistic goals. So before actually, you know, inserting the teaching like pronunciation in the curriculum before actually writing syllables, instructors they have to put the realistic goals because even before teaching pronunciation. Uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, the, the clear whether uh, whether the teaching, uh, the, the particular instructor or uh, teacher is promoting will be successful or not. Uh, so the one of the criteria of a successful um, curriculum with the pronunciation embedded in it is defining intelligibility. So intelligibility has a paramount importance in the process of teaching pronunciation and that should be one of the goals both for teachers and learners because in this today's world like as we have already mentioned mimicking the native uh, instructors is not a goal anymore uh, rather uh, we have to try to sound intelligible so others can understand us and also we have to communicate with them and also there is a problem of accent and identity that those uh, notions are also very important naturally um when we teach uh english as a foreign language uh, like you know as a foreign language 
our learners naturally have, they have accents and they should be okay with that. It's actually okay to have accent and uh, for the uh, for the sake of like you know the correcting their accent, our learners shouldn't lose their identity. So the, these uh, these are uh, like the things that the teachers should contemplate on and uh, should consider when they start teaching uh, in their classroom. And also the pronunciation models, it's very important like uh, to, for, for instructors to be, uh, to be a model themselves at the first, uh, in the first place, uh, if they are not, uh, because this is, this is one of the problems uh, in a, a foreign language uh, teaching context. Uh, a lot of times teachers themselves uh, may not sound uh, like, you know, the, I don't want to say unintelligible, but uh, it's it may it might be very uh, hard for uh, for themselves to be to be a model for their learners. So uh, if this is the case, they have to uh, uh, learn how to pick up, like how to use the authentic materials in their classroom uh, as a pronunciation models. And also, uh, the the instructor should uh, consider the learner, specifically the learners L one. Why? Uh, because um, every language has their unique characteristics and the unique sounds. Um, although, although, like you know, the majority of the languages, um, you know, that they share kind of mutual or the, the very close sounds with each other, there is like uh, very uh, delicate intricacies uh, where uh, some metalinguistic knowledge is. Uh, uh, needed to, for stu uh, students to identify the, the problems and try to correct them on a conscious uh, level. So uh, for that purpose, uh, the instructor should uh, consider the learners L1 and uh, just co considering the fact uh, of the learners L1 makes uh, teaching pronunciation uh, way way easier in terms of uh, planning the certain the materials uh, to be used in the classroom. For example, in our context, in Uzbek uh, context, uh, we have some sounds uh, that is very difficult for Uzbek people, like the sound. There is no the sound in uh, the Uzbek, so the Uzbek students make uh, like they have. Uh, very difficult time producing that sound. So that should be one of the priorities for instructors to uh, in, the, in their curriculum, uh, rather than, um, I don't know, a lot of ca uh, consonants are pretty much similar um, with the English. And those uh, sounds can be like deprioritized. Uh, and uh, the, some of the sounds which does not exist in Uzbek language can be prioritized. Uh, to kind of accelerate the process of teaching pronunciation. And also, um, as a final point, uh, the instructor should consider the learner's speaking needs, like uh, in which context uh, uh, they're going to work or why they are learning the language. Is, is, it, is it that important for them to uh, uh, be able to speak like a native-like language or... Uh, the, the the you know the kind of negotiating the syllables uh, before the class starts is very important for that purpose. Uh, considering your learner speaking uh, needs is very important. Okay, and uh, so as uh, we already know, uh, teachers usually try to assess the teaching situation before the classes start. So when they are assessing the situation. Uh, except the factors that we have mentioned in the previous slide, uh, they also need to consider these big like three uh, factors, uh, which are setting, uh, learner, and the context. So the setting, what kind of setting uh, like is it for teachers uh, to teach the pronunciation? Is it ESL classroom? or are they uh, teaching in the EFL, or is it EIL, English uh, as an international language? Obviously, uh, uh, like for today's purpose, we will be talking more about e for the EFL class uh, classes, but uh, a lot of times teachers find themselves in ESL context or EIL. So that's very important because uh, that, that uh, 
that may change the course of the uh you know writing the syllabus because uh you know it takes a lot of um the, the the factors to consider and also the learner so the the who are they is it uh like the classroom there are um uh, multinational or just they share only one uh language or so the, the that that is uh, about the learners l1 and also the, the learners how how old they are and um so like if they are like you know adults do they work or if they are uh, young people uh do they have like like the classes and the the, the load of the class they have so the, everything should be considered for the successful outcome of the class and the learner speaking needs uh so that that's been already talked about in the previous class in the previous uh, slide uh, so these are things to be considered. And finally, the context. So the as we see here, so I think uh, I'm going to need to uh, move myself a little bit uh, to the side. Okay, just like this. All right. So, uh, so one of them is uh, national language policy. So... Each and every country has their like own national language policy when it comes uh, uh, to teaching at schools. For example, in Uzbekistan, the, um, the 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 Ministry of Education or Minister of, uh, of Higher Education, uh, th these are two main institutions who, uh, like which control or the uh, monitor the process in uh, in schools or at the universities. So teachers, they have to deal with that policy because uh, some uh, national language policies allow a lot of room for teaching pronunciation while others, they don't. And there's, there are certain standards and rules where uh, a certain amount of like, you know, you know the changes teachers can make uh, in their curriculum. So uh, definitely instructors need to know about that. And the curriculum and materials. So uh, like linking to the, the first point, uh, they have to be, for example, in the context of Uzbekistan, uh, the curriculum is provided, uh, you know, the from the the, the ministry and uh, we kind of have to write our syllabus based on that so we have to kind of comply with the curriculum given by higher institution and uh, instructional resources so when teachers are going to their classroom they have to know what kind of instructional resources are available do they have a recorder do they have a tape recorder uh the 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 uh, i mean um, all the necessary stuff um to aid the teaching pronunciation process and also as a final point class size and time allotment so how many people are in one classroom for example in chinese context there are like very large classes like up to 80 students in one class but luckily in uzbekistan we have uh, up to 15 16 uh, students in one class that's uh, that's um, that's very good and uh, makes the job for the instructors uh, very easy and time allotment how much time do uh, do the uh, like you know the instructors have so uh, why do they have to know about it because uh, they don't only teach pronunciation there are other skills they have to teach too so the pronunciation as being just one being one tiny part of the um, syllabus teachers need to consider uh, the time allotment in the individual class. All right, so, okay, I'm gonna fly to the side again. So uh, defining a core curriculum. Uh, so as we obviously know, no pronunciation course uh, can, oh, uh, there is a uh, typing issue here. 
Sorry about that. So uh, the no pronunciation course can teach uh, everything. So like pronunciation is a huge, right? So we can teach all of the stuff in that, but we have to be very selective. And uh, based on the factors that we talked about in previous classes, we have we have to selectively pick up, you know, uh, certain items, certain things in the pronunciation, which are very useful and uh, we have to prioritize them. And also, uh, the, the Jenner 1989 uh, uh, was one of the first to call for this using the term common core to describe the elements of intelligibility common to native speakers of all varieties of English. This is one of the amazing sources teachers need definitely to check. So uh, Jenner uh, came up with the common core, uh, which is like uh, the fundamental at a fundamental level, um, the, 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 the collection of the, you know, the items so to say in pronunciation department the teachers have to have uh like to organize their class so and uh the gilbert uh priorities for beginning learners so this is another uh, source uh amazing source so give the gilbert uh prioritized uh some core stuff for beginning learners and so uh they they are at a, at a, uh, the first of them is a set of core vowels with a focus on sound spelling correspondences. Um, so as we know, Eng English vowel system is very complicated and definitely it's very different from Uzbek language. And in Uzbek language, for example, we have only six uh, vowels. And uh, when it comes to English, it gets very complicated. And we don't have those vowel sounds and uh, students have a very hard time to produce. So consonants that serve as grammatical signals, that's very a uh, very important point as well. And that should be taught at a elementary uh, level on the, at the beginning uh, learner's level. And also linking between words. So sometimes a super segmental level knowledge is uh, much more, it seems like it's much more important than the uh, segmental level, because uh, if we can pronounce and stress the words, for example, or pronounce uh, uh, the pronounce certain sounds individually, uh, but if we, if we don't have the super segmental level knowledge where we cannot put the correct stress or link the words um, we may still not sound intelligible. And also the number of syllabuses. Um, and uh, this is also uh, on a super segmental level uh, alongside with the linking uh, between words. Uh, Uzbek students, uh, they tend to add extra syllabus, uh, syllabuses uh, especially for the plural, um, when they add the plural S at the end of the sentence, because uh, in Uzbek language, the stress is always comes at the end of the sentence, uh, sentence uh, the, the word. So um, they have to add an extra syllabus and they transfer their knowledge from their L1. And in English, uh, they do the same thing, like uh, they add extra syllabus at the end. And the same thing happens with the, on the past tense of the words. Uh, so instead of sounding like t at the end, they uh, uh, they do uh, they sound like they add extra syllabus at the end. Uh, for example, uh, when they add the plural s, for example, uh, links instead of saying links, they say linkis. Or uh, when they said uh, worked, uh, they always say worked. So it's it's it takes a lot of time uh, to actually work on that and. It sounds easy, uh, but um, definitely instructors need to uh, work with their students on that. And uh, so word stress and the importance of distinguishing strong and weak syllabuses. That is also, uh, you know, the very, very important, especially in the context of Uzbek uh, learners. A lot of times, as I mentioned above, uh, the stress comes at the end of the sentence, and in English, a lot of times it falls on the like the, like, uh, the beginning of the word. Um, of course, it get, it may uh, fall anywhere. Um, a lot of time relating to the root of the word, uh, but they have to have that metalinguistic knowledge where to put the stress to 
uh, pronounce the word correctly. And the prominence, also very important, and the thought grouping. So these are the things, uh, as Gilbert thinks, uh, very important for uh, beginning learners to uh, learn in the pronunciation department. So uh, the, the same kind of work was uh, done by Jenkins, and uh, she also established a uh, lingua franca core. So what she is saying that uh, learners have to learn consonant consonants except the, the and velarized or dark mm, I'll sound why this is a, this is a little bit different here as uh, Jenkins think that uh, even though the and the uh, these are like one of the very important sounds in English um, like if learners transfer their L1 and they sound like uh, they pr pronounce these sounds like Z that's still okay because it is intelligible, it can be understood. So they have to prior prioritize the other consonants first, because if they cannot pronounce those sounds, they may cause way more problem than pronouncing the and the. Luckily, in, in Uzbek language, we have uh, mostly, uh, like we have problems with the the and the, so we can um, directly um, focus on these sounds and the L sound like in pool, milk, full, full. Uh, these words are also uh, like, you know, in these words, the L is dark. So for example, it was big students may sound like pool, uh, but it has to be pronounced like pool. Uh, but it's okay if they cannot uh, do that because it still can be understood by, by other people. Certain positional variation features such as aspiration and vowel lengthening. This is also very, very important. Uh, for example, the aspiration in English sounds, sounds um, they are aspirated uh, in, unlike in Uzbek. For example, in Uzbek, we have the word... Um, Piola, uh, it's it's very hard, kind of like it's not aspirated, uh, and we we uh, like we are so used to make this uh, you know the sound uh, in the in English, it's hard to you know turn into aspirated sounds in English. It comes with a puff as of a sound, like it's not. Uh, it's not like um, I'm trying to think of a word like uh, like when you say Peter it sound it comes with a puff of sound uh, puff of air. Okay, the uh, constant uh, consonant cluster features uh, like no, it's it's not no, it's no. It's very uh, important for students to know at an uh, initial level, and it's it's uh, for example wrong. It's not wrong, uh, and the tense and lax vowel distinction. Some some sounds are long, and some of them are short, and also uh, it may cause uh, like a, a very uh, the, the problematic situations where misunderstanding happens. So the longness and shortness of the sounds uh, is very important to know. And the, the prominence is the final point. Uh, so these are the things uh, that Jenkins uh, recommends. And also Zelinsky pr prioritized for native speakers and non-native speakers communication. So uh, Zelinsky in 2008 found two things contribute most to intelligibility between native speakers and non-native speakers. They are accurate word stress and accurate production of the sounds in the stressed syllabus. So like I completely agree with him. And uh, so uh, these two things are the fundamentally one of the important things uh, for, for, for learners to know uh, to successfully uh, pronounce and communicate with others. And uh, so when... Uh, when it comes to pronunciation instruction for a specific group of learners, so so far we were talking about we were talking about like you know uh, we've talked about uh, 
you know, the, how, like the assessing the situation and uh, the, 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 what kind of core things uh, students have to know. Uh, and we've been talking about the, the schools, right? And uh, for a specific uh, group of learners, we need to find out who the learners are and what they need and also find language that is relevant to the learners to use as a practical material. And the, this specific groups might not be school uh, students. They might be adults, like working professionals. So th th there should be a different approach for them. And we, we have to use authentic language samples to pr practice specific pronunciation features. And also we have to provide frequent choral repetition with body movement. And we have to give learners a chance to practice similar language in less controlled activities. And also, as a final point, record learner speech for feedback and review. So the next point we have to discuss is testing and evaluation. So without testing and with, without evaluating the student's knowledge, it's very important to know where we are at and where we're going to move forward, right? So uh, diagnostic tests for listening discrimination should test the learner's ability to distinguish both segmental and supersegmental features. So as we know, segmental uh, level knowledge in pronunciation department uh, uh, is uh, like individual sounds and supersegmental features are prominence, uh, stress, intonation, linking, uh, like, you know, the linking the words and et cetera, and et cetera. Okay. So, Celsa Mercia uh, says it's in order to uh, determine the learner's ability to distinguish vowel and consonant sounds, the teacher can use minimal pair discrimination exercise. Learners mark one of the choices in the min minimal pair. So the min minimal pair exercise uh, are very beneficial for learners to identify the difference between uh, different sounds. Uh, so Celsa Mercia recommends that, and it's also it has become, uh, you know, the uh, the mainstream practice uh, when it comes to teaching pronunciation. So we will uh, look through uh, some of the examples here. So I picked up uh, some evaluation or testing uh, activities. So here, as we can see, uh, we can test the student's knowledge by giving these tests here two pictures don't slip on the floor slip like here the the guy here is slipping and he's falling and also don't sleep on the floor don't sleep on the floor so we can give this two variants and ask the student to choose which one for which and also here another uh another very uh good example he's gone to back up the car and uh, he's got to pack up the car. So the, the minimal pair um, like exercise uh, for the sounds of B and P, uh, that is very important. And it may cause a lot of problems for Arabic students, for example, because in Arabic language, there is no P. They, they, they only have the sounds B. They would say like they have gone to back up the car and back up the car for both of the sentences. Uh, so in the first uh, set, the example, uh, there is longness and shortness of the sound. In the slip, there is like very short contracted form it sound. And in the sleep, sleep, like mm, there is a slide uh, and the longness of this sound. And this test helps to identify the student's knowledge on the, uh, you know, the tense and lax uh, features of the sounds and also here we can uh, uh you know give a test and uh, explain to the students the marked by capital letters here this some part of the words is uh, like you know are marked by capital letters that means the stress and uh, students need to uh choose which one which word has a uh, correct stress Okay, so and and so on. Uh, so we we can we can do it uh, like on a sentence level. So rather than the word level, and uh, this is the book from uh, Teaching Pronunciation by uh, Silsa Marcia, uh, and uh, 
Brendan Goodwin. So I definitely recommend for EFL instructors to check it out. So another another um, example of evaluation uh, materials is uh, here. In each line of four words, circle the word that has a different initial sound, like sugar, sun, city, sock. Uh, as we obviously know that the first word sugar has a different initial sound, although uh, they have pretty much the same, uh, you know, the form, uh, the same letters except the city. Okay, so the, 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 this is another uh, example. So we can go on uh, with uh, with these uh, tools and they're very helpful to identify our learner skill. And we can use this at the beginning of the, before we start the course and while we are doing that and uh, uh, when we finish the course. So, and also there are like a production tests production test here as we can see it's not a word level anymore we uh, we can uh, we are doing that on a sentence level and also on a um, paragraph level so here record the following passage paying special attention to the underlined vowel sounds here in this paragraph certain sounds are underlined like living here short ones right and face, this is the long one. So the students need to record their voice by paying attention to the underlying vowels. So, and uh, instructors can check their the, the recorded voice and give feedback. Also, uh, they can write their syllables accordingly based on the knowledge they have uh, on this evaluation uh, materials. Okay, and um, also, uh, so, so th the tools, like the things we have been talking about was uh, kind of uninformal uh, tools the teachers can uh, use in their classroom. And apart from that, there are former oral proficiency testing instruments out there. So uh, one of them is TOEFL IBT, and another one is... Um, very famous one in Uzbek context is International Language Testing System. We we call it IELTS. And uh, besides that, we have other types of uh, standardized tests like Versant, uh, Interagency Language Roundtable, Oral Proficiency Interview and Rating Scale, and UCLA Test of Oral Proficiency for International Teaching Assistance. So they, they basically... Uh, uh, pretty much all of them uh, test not only pronunciation, they uh, test the four skills, but as part of the speaking skill, there is uh, a criteria uh, for a correct uh, pronunciation uh, when they are, you know, scoring in the in speaking skill. So I, I am um, more familiar with the IELTS one. So in the speaking part, uh, there is a pronunciation criteria. Uh, so the students need to pronounce the, um, the, the words correctly. Uh, and uh, also, um, so, so also that what they have, like if they speak fluent, like fluently, uh, fluency is tested, so they have to know how to link um, uh, the words in a sentence and also how to uh, place the stress correctly to achieve and to score better in those tests. And uh, ongoing evaluation with feedback, as I have mentioned at the beginning of the uh, lecture, uh, the evaluation of the learner's knowledge uh, should be ongoing. And this ongoing process can be in different forms, like self-monitoring and correction, peer feedback and teacher feedback and correction. So we're going to briefly stop by each point. So the first one is self-monitoring and correction. Uh, students should define their own learning objectives. So it's uh, it's kind of... Uh, it's kind of funny that uh, at first sight, uh, teachers might think that when students, uh, you know, that try to self-monitor, a lot of times they are biased. They think they are pronouncing everything correctly and they have 
uh, you know, the, 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 they have different standards for themselves. But uh, latest uh, research studies show that it's actually very beneficial for students to like, you know, the, the self, like a, to become a little more self-conscious and um, like consciously focus on their uh, mistakes and try to correct them. Uh, and as we know from the noticing uh, theory, uh, just one of the initial levels of uh, correcting uh, the mistakes is noticing. So this, and this helps a lot. Uh, they should have the control of their learning activities. Definitely it helps with that. And they need to be able to select techniques and methodologies that suit their individual learning styles. So in the process, in the process of correcting themselves, they can they consciously, a lot of times subconsciously, you know, the uh they get to choose their uh, like see there's uh, the certain the methods and techniques that are suited best for them and also uh they should have a voice in evaluating their progress and this uh, this uh boils down to you know the communication uh between teachers and students and how they uh you know negotiate uh their progress like evaluate the progress and in that in that pr process uh definitely the students should be heard and the peer feedback and another um thing that uh should happen in the classroom is the peer feedback so uh, like students they should evaluate monitor their, their progress uh themselves at the same time uh instru instructors uh should create an opportunity for uh, learners to work together with each other and uh, you know try to correct each other that's also uh the um, the findings um uh, proposed by latest research that when students are corrected by their peers it's uh it's uh it's likely you know to be corrected why because uh, a lot of times uh, when a student uh, demonstrates uh, their his or her skill, not only one, a lot of times, uh, like, you know, a few people will be listening and trying to, you know, that they will be ready to correct. So uh, this suggests that in peer feedback part, if the group is like the bigger the group is, the better for the students. See? Uh, so not only pair work in a group, uh, if students try to you know work with each other and give peer feedback, it's always better. So um, here there is one example, listen and mark the words you hear. So when uh, students read the sentences and others try to uh, correct it or try to, uh, you know, to get the meaning. So only two seeds are left or only two seeds are left. So uh, you see, uh, so when when one student is reading, other students are listening. At the same time, they're listening ability, they're, they're teaching uh, the, the pronunciation skills, uh, you know, they are increasing. At the same time, uh, they, 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 they might stop, you know, the commenting on the producers. Uh, mistakes as well and uh, so teachers uh, fe teacher feedback and correction and uh, like always uh, teachers give feedback and correct themselves and uh, as we know there are you know different kind of uh, feedbacks like explicit and implicit so based on the, the teaching philosophy or of like you know particular uh, instructors, they can choose uh, explicit or implicit uh, instructional feedback, or they can choose this based on the um, context or the situation. Uh, so how can they how can they do it? They can uh, record learners' speech and give feedback. So uh, because sometimes it may be problematic for like to correct students because uh, like as soon as they uh, finish their utterances and teachers give feedback and students think that they produce the sound just as a teacher explained so it's better to record uh their uh, you know the production and give the feedback if this um misunderstanding happens uh the the teachers can always replay the recordings and uh, they can work on the mistakes so and uh thirdly the learners make an oral dialogue journal journal outside the class and be evaluated by the teachers so that that is another um 
wonderful approach uh, that can be uh, implemented um, by by the teachers. So basically, learners make uh, you know record their voice daily, uh, and that they uh, keep sending it to their instructors, uh, and uh, they can get the feedback on that. So techniques, tools, and the technology. So by incorporating knowledge from other disciplines, such as psychology, neurolinguistics, theater arts, we can open up avenues to enhance pronunciation and learning. So uh, the, so as, as we know, linguistics is not developing as a separate branch of knowledge, right? So the we, a lot of, uh, you know, the new stuff, new things are getting implemented by like, you know, borrowed from the findings of other um, uh, disciplines like psychology, neuro neurolinguistics, theater arts. So likewise, in uh, teaching pronunciation, we can, we can use um, the, the scholars' findings and the like tendencies from those uh, uh, knowledge areas and uh, try to improve our uh, pronunciation teaching. So for example, uh, techniques, uh, breathing and relaxation techniques. So th this has uh, a lot of benefits for students. And uh, I read that in the Western uh, countries, even before teaching pronunciation, instructors ask the students to breathe deeply and try to relax. So basically they help to lose their muscles and try to get uh, to be ready for, you know, the, the, the pronounce uh, the sounds unknown to them or uh, to like kind of set the uh the like you know to prepare the body and the muscles in the uh in their mouth for example uh, to pronounce very like difficult sounds and fluency building techniques uh we know a lot of techniques about uh building fluency so by by practicing on fluency activities we actually uh inc like improve our uh, pronunciation. A multi-sensory uh, reinforcement te techniques like visual, auditory, tactile, and kinesthetic. This came from ne neurolinguistics and uh, also psychology. So uh, basically in order to help our learners to remember some of the sounds, we can uh, we use visual clues. Um, I don't know the the the, the when it uh, when, when we want to know the shortness we can just make a mimic like short eh sound or e sound or auditory uh, like like tactile uh, by showing up or visual we we can uh, use uh, certain uh, visuals cards. Uh, for example, uh, there is a very good technique uh, that a lot of uh, pronunciation teachers use uh, are the colors. So, so the, every color um, have a, a certain vowel sounds, for example, red, uh, like short eh sounds. So what teachers do is they carry the red card and the, when the students are pronouncing this particular sound incorrectly, they st start showing the red card like red. Uh, for example, aqua or um, green e sound. So the, the Uzbek people have a tough time with these, and it's very uh, like you know it, it becomes very handy to use the green card for them in the class. And uh, drama techniques. Drama techniques are also very important. So by dramatizing the situation, like the, especially by uh, role playing. <clears throat> students uh, usually, uh, you know, easily learn how to put the stress and how to use the stress and how to link the wor words in a sentence. And imitation techniques, shadowing and mirroring. So we can do that by, uh, you know, the, the playing certain um um, material on the uh, tape and asking students to repeat after that. Uh, so the, if they repeat whatever is being said on the tape, like, I don't know, like one or two seconds afterwards, that shadowing. 
And we can do the same thing at the same time. If the students try to repeat the same thing at the same time. A lot of times they not they don't have to sound. They just you know the, um, the, the try to mimic and use their lips. Uh, that's mirroring. Uh, and uh, we can also use a dramatic imitative approach using video clips. Uh, so th for the same purpose, we can um, bring in uh, some uh, authentic video clips and. Uh, and try to practice with the students. And we have a lot of tools like gadgets and props. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to think um, some of the gadgets, for example, we can uh, we can use the rubber, regular rubber uh, in the classroom. This helps like uh, it's free, it's accessible. We can uh, demonstrate the, the longness of the sound by like, you know, stretching the rubber and when we are pronouncing certain sounds, also we can uh, bring in uh, mirrors. Mirrors help us to pronounce certain sound, like nasal sounds. When when we uh, pronounce the nasal sounds, uh, we have to put it in like just under under the nose. So and it, when they uh, produce the nasal sounds, there should be a cloud on the mirror. If that happens, they are. Uh, pronouncing the uh, that nasal sound correctly. If not, they have to work on that. And uh, cartoons. So the cartoons are like a huge help in you know the teaching pronunciation. Um, cartoons are not only for you know the children. Even uh, adults watch cartoon, and it's very interesting. So the, by watching cartoons, definitely they improve their pronunciation. And games, there are so many games. And uh, to, to practice pronunciation, definitely we need to make use of that. And jokes and riddles, they are very short, funny, interesting. And a lot of times they have to be retold, right? So we need to use a lot of jokes. And poetry and rhyming. So poetry is another example where, you know, st students try to you know, to say the or read the uh, poetry correctly. And in this process, they pra uh, to practice pronunciation and they improve their pronunciation. And songs, songs are amazing tools uh, because, uh, you know, a lot of people, I can say all, uh, that they like uh, songs and, you know, it's easy to sing along. And and subconsciously, it's easier to you know to learn certain sounds, especially linking the words and uh, technology. Luckily, we are living in a in an, in a wonderful time where um, you know the the majority uh, you know of the world they have access to a uh, fundamental. Uh, primitive uh, technology tools like uh, we can use audio, video, pronunciation softwares, and the internet. Okay, so um, audio uh, it comes in the classroom and in, in form uh, in the form of you know audio recorder, type recorder, video. We can do it. We can uh, display the video on a projector. Or, or even these days, students a lot like um, students have their own cell phones, and uh, we can just share links and uh, watch the videos on their uh, cell phones. And like, if they have the cell phone, there are so many pronunciation software in the Play Market or Google App Store. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the App Store. So uh, they are designed by wonderful. The, the, the companies instead of people uh, to you know to help the um, correct the pronunciation and we need to uh, definitely make the use of them and the majority of them uh, are free uh, if if you if you know that sometimes the ads are annoying but uh, that should be okay for for the people who are in search of knowledge and the definitely internet is an endless source of knowledge and uh, so we can pretty much find everything in the internet and everything is accessible. So we definitely need to make use of that. So, and uh, finally, uh, we need to 
Mm -hmm. I talk about the recommendations of mm, teaching pronunciation for B1 level learners. So uh, as in the CEFR standard, B1 level comes in the third place. Uh, so in Uzbek context, uh, the B1 learners are the students in 10th grade and 11th grade and also academic lyceum. It equals to IELTS 4 to 5 band score and APTIS uh, and like it, it's intermediate and the, the beginner intermediate uh, independent user level. So in the, in in Uzbekistan, uh, the professor Jamal Jalalov, uh, he did like he did a lot of work in uh, method teaching methodology sphere, and he basically you know sorted out the things that have to be taught in each level in Uzbekistan. So uh, he recommends that in the initial stage of education, almost all sounds are introduced. So we can understand from here that he's recommended, he's recommending the um, segmental level of the pronunciation as uh, at the initial stage of uh, teaching pronunciation. So in the middle stage, he recommends teaching new sound combination, stress, and intonation. Here we can see that the repetition of the uh, segmental level knowledge and also uh, slowly moving toward super segmental levels. And in the middle or higher stage, pronunciation subskills are improved through listening. Uh, pronunciation subskills are developed. So teaching pronunciation to B1 level learners uh, are performed by developing listening and speaking skills. So in the B1 level, learners are like, you know, they already have uh, a good, like a foundation based knowledge. They uh, they already can like uh, enter into communication and uh, they can uh, express their, uh, you know, thoughts on th to a certain level. Definitely they are not the beginner learners. So we need to make use of a lot of listening and speaking skills as part of the teaching pronunciation. Okay, uh, so the uh, we used uh, several uh, wonderful sources uh, to present this uh, lecture, and uh, for for the Uzbek context, Jamal Jalalov is one of the best sources, and definitely, definitely, I recommend uh, Mariana Celso Mercias and Britain's uh, Goodwin's, uh, the book, Teaching Pronunciation, Cambridge University Press, 2014, and also Jeremy Harmer and uh, Miller Roots. So thank you very much for your attention and see you later.